Pleasure. You're such a pro. Oh, thank you. It's very nice to have you. I love the books too. They're, they're short. There's lots of them. Exactly. So you can always you can they're always like follow. Peanuts. They're like peanuts. That's exactly right. Um, so here we are, 2012. Are you hopeful? What a new year that was. It's fantastic. Wow. Right? Wow. <laughs> How was your New Year's Eve party, everybody? <laughs> yeah. uh, no, seriously, 2012. What do you? What do you? What do you what Here's the thing. The recession is a forever recession. There's so? a cyclical recession that comes and goes. But there's this other thing, and it's the end of the industrial age. It lasted for 80 years. For 80 years, you got a job, you did what you were told, you retired. And good people could make above average pay for average work. And it ended. And so 2012 is not going to be more of the same. It's going to be worse of the same in that the industrial age is going away and a new thing is going to take its place. It doesn't strike me as we're a group of people who are prepared for this new thing yet. Totally unprepared. Absolutely. Because our schools, our systems, our retirement things, our taxes are all built around this notion of doing what you're told. And now we don't know what to do because it's a revolution. And so what do you think we should do? Pick yourself. Don't wait for someone to pick you. If you have a book, you don't need a publisher to pick you. You can publish it yourself. If you want to write, write. If you want to sing, sing. If you want to start a movement, start a movement. But this shift is that it doesn't matter whether you own a building or own a big company. You can now make an impact if you want to. Well, there was this idea that people think the government owes them a job, or at least owes them the opportunity to get a job. Has that changed? Well, I think the thinking hasn't changed at all, because that's what we grew up to believe, that this notion of you pay your taxes and you do what you're told and there's a pension and a safety net is hardwired in. Andrew Carnegie, Henry Ford, all those guys built it into the system. And now it's starting to crumble, and the jobs are moving. There's a McDonald's in California. You pull into the drive through and you say your order, and you can see the guy 12 feet away who's flipping burgers. You're not talking to him. Yeah. It goes over TCP IP through the internet and a satellite to someone in South Dakota who's making 12 cents less an hour, who types in what you said and back over, because they could save 12 cents doing that. So there's this race to the bottom. And if, if you're going to say, I'm an average guy doing average work, we'll find someone cheaper than you. But is it that there was a revolution, or is it that corporations felt like they had an, um, an unfettered path. Yeah, capitalism has always needed boundaries. And so if you got people racing, and if the boundaries get loosened, they're going to race faster. The alternative, though, which I'm much more interested in, is the race to the top. So while there's people who are racing to the bottom, there's... What's the race to the bottom? What is that? Yeah, the race to the bottom is, how do we get cheaper? How does everything get cheaper? More Walmarts, more Targets, more stuff made by people who are getting paid ever less from cheaper materials, cheaper services, whatever. The problem with the race to the bottom is you might win. Which, is, which really sucks, yeah, right? Totally. The alternative is to race to the top. And some people are getting to race to the top because the internet and this revolutionary connection engine that we're all living with says if you can figure out how to do something interesting or unique or noteworthy, people will find you and pay you extra because you're not like everyone else but cheaper. You're different than everyone and more expensive. Yeah, but the whole system needs to change. Yeah. Wow, do you really like it or not, it's all turning upside down. Is this one of the things like the record business where regardless of how we feel, it's going to change? Do you think it will change? Yeah. So the record business was perfect, George, in 1972. Everything about it was perfect. Rolling Stone magazine, uh, American Top 40, right Billboard. To the, right to the late, mid-90s. Yeah, and then right? yeah. gone, all at once. More music now by more musicians listened to more often by more people. All of that's great, but the industry that made it, gone. And so the same thing is going to happen to Canadian Tire, and the same thing is going to happen to Tim Hortons, and the same thing is going to happen to the local hotel and everybody else. They're either going to have to choose that we're just like everyone else but a little cheaper, or they're going to have to say we're the only one. Like Rita's Candy Shop, halfway between here and Algonquin Park. Yeah. Rita's has a line out the door all summer long. She and her husband make hundreds of thousands of dollars, even though there's all these other places on Highway 11 yeah. that are struggling, because they're all the same. But there's only one reader. It's like Weber's if, you, if you're going north right as well. Right next door to Weber's. That's right. Exactly. Algonquin Park's big in your life, isn't it? Yeah. And when did you first go there? 1970, when I was 10 years old. There's, there's a whole run of American guys who went up to uh, Camp Erwan, right? Yeah. So when you first got there, what did you think of Algonquin Park? Well, you know, when you're 10 years old, all you want to do is go home because you're homesick. But then you look around and there's beaver and moose and trees and, and that wears off when you're 10 years old after a couple hours. But the first time you see a moose is crazy, right? Yeah, <laughs> this is like unbelievable. I was like the second day, there was a bear in my cabin. <laughs> but what really transformed me was 
there are these 16 foot long handmade cedar strip canoes. And at one point in the 50s, still in the 50s, it was the number one vehicle in all of Canada was the canoe. And a 16 foot long canoe is really big. If you're 10 years old, you've never piloted something that big yourself. Maybe a bike, but that's it. Yeah. And this guy, Chuck LeBeau, got me in the boat, and I learned how to do it by myself. And that's what changed my life. Some this powerful. notion that I, even at the age of 10, could decide where to head and could be on my own. What about, I love the idea of everybody doing what they want, but the reality is there are a lot of jobs that just need to get done. There are jobs that yeah. don't go away. Someone needs to do them, yeah. but it doesn't have to be you, does it, George? Well, who doesn't? Well, I'll worry about those people second. Right now, I'm worried about where are all the people stepping up, raising their hand, saying, I want to sing for you, I want to write for you, I want to connect for you, I want to lead this group. Right? You look at the, the, the thing that's been going on all last year with the Occupy movement. One of the interesting things about it is 24-year-olds, for no money, stood up and said, follow me. Yeah. Not all of them, just a few. Well, we can replicate that by organizing people, uh, First Peoples, or organizing people who are really into listening to vinyl records, or whatever it is you care about. What do you think, you know, the idea of going out and doing stuff, though, and if making yourself happy doing what you want, people are just conditioned to be afraid of things. And I think our gen parents' generation really beat that into us. Yeah. You need stability. Is Like, people are just afraid of failing, isn't that it? Well, I understand 20,000 guys mostly men at Ford Motor Company lost their job on one day. Yeah. All of them had done everything they were told, and they all lost their job. So don't tell me stability is stable, because it's not. There's part of our brain right back here, the amygdala, it's the prehistoric brain, the lizard brain. It's in charge of revenge and anger and reproduction. It's the one that makes you change your outfit before a blind date and eat a whole chocolate cake when you're depressed. Isn't that reproduction and anger and revenge are together? Exactly. Jeez. All in one little wild animal kind of thing. So, you need to recognize the voice of that lizard. When it speaks up, when it freaks out because there's turbulence on the plane or because you're worried your boss's caller ID is on the phone, you need to say to their voice, thanks for letting me know, now let's move on. Mm -hmm. As opposed to having this fight with it, because that's what freezes us up. It's got a couple of books, We're All Weird and Poke the Box. Seth Godin,